Direct from the Broski Nation headquarters in Los Angeles, California, this is the Broski Report with your host, Brittany Broski. Hey guys, welcome back to the Broski Report. Sorry, me, your host, Brittany Broski of the Broski Report. Guys, so many updates, because I'll let you in on a little secret. I pre-filmed nine episodes of the podcast before I left for Spain, and I just ran out of them. So this one, this one's current. Okay, guys, I'm filming this uh, mid-July. So welcome, everyone, back to the Broski Report. It's been a long time for me, not a long time for you guys. You know why? Because that's show business. That's show business. And I'll teach you something about show. You'll never make it in this town, sweetheart. You'll never make it in this town, sweetheart, without showing a little bit of your legs. I do a really good, actually, like, you know, like the Gregory Peck, like, now, nah, now, nah, listen here. But the the transatlantic woman is very, well, I just don't know about that, really. I, I really don't. No, that's British. Hold on. Hold on. I can do it. Well, I'll never forget what we spent together in New York and in Paris. Thank you. Thank you. I'll never forget the beautiful memories that you gave me, Gregory. Really, truly. That's very Audrey Hepburn, okay? I can do that. Thank you for your wisdom and grace that you've always given me. Okay, moving on. Guys, so many updates. First of all, number one, new mic, okay? Shout out to Sure, the company, the podcasting equipment company. They sent me this mic and it's beautiful. And like, let me know if you hear a difference because this old one was so like Ed Sullivan's sleigh, like old Elvis mic. But listen, there's no padding in this room. And I think you guys can kind of maybe tell that because it's echoey. And I'm really, really just working my podcast editor. <laughs> she is a soldier of Broski Nation. She's actually a five-star general. So everybody give it up for Laura because, um, damn. They sent me this mic and it is a, it's a 50 year anniversary sure podcasting microphone. I think it's a one of a kind and I'm kind of freaking out because I don't deserve that. Number one. And number two, I'm going to break it. Okay. Hey, I'm going to break it. So why'd you send it to me? But it is very beautiful. And I hope that you can really tell a difference in the audio quality. Second of all, I have Cody Co. Noel Miller earphones. Ear, these in-ears, dude, look at this. I'm a podcaster. I am a podcaster. For all you bitches that say I'm not a podcaster, look at me now. I had to pick my nose. Sorry. Okay, guys, the hair. The long blonde is gone, okay? I saw this girl on Instagram who had this hair that was like, oh my God, I just needed it. And it was blonde on top and it was brunette on the bottom. And I was like, it's so, it looked natural. Like it looked very beautiful. And, and the the um, mixture and the combination of the colors was so, and it was short and it was just full and bouncy and beautiful. And I was like, you know what? Love, 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 love having long blonde hair. <laughs> I love having long blonde hair, but, and so I was like, I'm ready for a change. And so I did this kind of short brunette thing and I am living. I'm loving it. I'm living for it. We're getting up here. We're going and doing the damn thing. Oh, 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 oh. Let's do the damn thing. Why is that the bachelorette like slogan? Let's do the damn thing. What I wanted to say about the hair is I have a favorite TikToker, okay? His name is Matthew CBA, and I love him to goddamn death. I just love him to goddamn death. He is darling. He is this beautiful gay man from London, UK. I don't know if he's from London, but I know he used to live in London. And he has this like long hair and he's kind of going gray, but he makes it work. Like he slays. He's like mid late 20s and he makes it work. And he got a Dyson, okay? He has like famously incredible hair. Let me pull him up. This is my best friend. He just doesn't know it. I'll talk about him all the time. I really do. I love him so much. And he has like four videos up. Okay. He did a hair tutorial and he was like, here's what you'll need. You'll need like leave-in conditioner or whatever. And the Dyson. And I was like, fuck. Cause the Dyson is like $500. And so I bought one and it hurt. It hurt me. It was extremely painful to do that, to click add to cart and to buy. And I was like, is this stupid? Like, sh can I DIY this? I have tried to DIY like the 
heatless curls and the whatever. My hair is just so annoying on top because it's my real hair and then underneath is the extensions. So the extensions hold a curl really well and do whatever, but my real hair, good night, good luck. It's never, it never goes how I want it. My life is so hard. Like, shut up. I hear myself talking. I'm like, <laughs> I hope y'all don't feel the same. But you're <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Anyway, thank you for listening to my podcast. <laughs> anyway, he did a hair tutorial and I was like, it's time. And so I bought the Dyson and it comes with like the hair dryer tool, which is also anti-frizz. It comes with a little like hairbrush uh, heat tool, like the Revlon or whatever. Um, a, a, uh, <sighs> It's also 1 a.m. So my brain's like sputtering, sputtering. Cylinders are not firing. I don't know what's going on. Roller brush. It's got a roller brush. And then it's got that, the the famous like curling wand, quote unquote, that sucks the hair in, but it does not tangle it. It does not rip it out. I don't know how. It's science. It blows wind air through it, not like into it, if that makes sense. And so that that's what he used to curl his hair. And I was like, oh my God, it's time. I need to buy one. I'm doing it. Y'all come on now. Y'all come come on with me now. Come on with me now. Okay? I'm posted up in the leopard moo moo, brawless. Okay? I don't have any pants on. And I've got my curls in. Tell me I don't look like a rich trophy wife. I feel beautiful. And I did this probably, um, hold on, I'm pulling up my photo booth. I mean, I did this probably, I did this at 4.30 p.m., and it's 1 a.m. and it still looks incredible. My hair has never held a curl like this. It's truly, I don't know. I feel so beautiful every time I look at myself. I have never in my life had such great hair. Like I think honestly having less of it, because you can't do this with the really long hair. It's also summertime. Y'all go for it. If you are thinking about cutting your hair, do it. If you're thinking about cutting your hair, this is your sign to do it. Okay. Anyway, I love him and um, he's my style inspo, okay? He's my style inspo. I want to look like this skinny gay British man because in my brain, guess what? I look at Matthew and I say, that's exactly what I look like. That's actually exactly what I look like. And it's not, by the way. Because who do I look like? Pamela Anderson. Thank you for saying it. Alabama Barker. Thank you for saying that. And it's actually accurate, okay? Chat, is this real? Yes. Chat, is this biblically accurate? Yes, it is. Thank you for fact checking. You want to know something stupid? When the Brosy Report debuted, y'all got it up to number two on the Spotify charts. I was right under Joe Rogan. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) me and Bestie. That's me and Bestie Joey. That's me and my best friend, Joseph Rogan. Like, that's so funny to think Joe Rogan, who's like, fucking conspiracy theories and like really problematic white man shit and then it's like (laughs) where i'm like okay so today the hot topic is would you rather suck and fuck the hot ant from ants or nick wilde from zootopia and you can't have both and you also have to kill the other one also they have to duel for your attention i love the internet the power of the internet is truly beautiful okay anyway love matthew want to get blackout drunk with him at a gay bar in london next you bitches have been begging me. I'm ready to talk about it. And I'm looking at a picture of him right now because it's on my wall. Uh, Greta Van Fleet. <laughs> I uh, met Greta Van Fleet. <laughs> and I'll tell you how it happened too because it's not like a, oh my God, I just ran into them. Or like I knew them before. In um, Nashville last year, after um, a concert, I went to a bar with a friend and Danny was there. Hey, you're not allowed to be in public, actually. Greta Van Fleet, mm, go back to your crate. We're crate training Greta Van Fleet. You are not allowed to leave. You are not. You need to go potty. Okay, we'll take you out to potty. You can't leave other than that. So I saw Danny at this and I said, that's, you actually, guys, security, could we, yeah, it's like this tall white man. Could y'all just get him out of here? I am so sorry. Yes. Yes, he's bothering me. Yes, he's bothering me. <laughs> yes, he's bothering me. What did he do? Oh, nothing. He didn't do anything. I just love him. Oh, no, no, no. He didn't do anything. I just... Oh, I need to leave? 
Oh, I need. Okay, well, I still have like an open. T oh, I need to go now. Okay. Um, I'll see you guys at <laughs> how that night went. He was at this bar. Okay. And I was like, oh my God. And so we ended up meeting him and like, we have a mutual friend and it was just, it was like, I, it was a fever dream. And I was wearing a fucking jean jacket dude with a Greta Van Fleet pin on it. Anyway. Also, I have a Greta Van Fleet tattoo. I'm just over it. Then. So that was last year, like November of last year. This year I'm filming something in Hollywood. Okay. I was at a studio in Hollywood and I had a mutual friend text me and be like, you know, I'm here with the boys fuck you talking about the boys and they'd love to me they'd love to me can you hear me the am i breaking up oh can you hear me <laughs> that's how it felt <laughs> she was like they'd love to meet you if you're like we were relatively close to each other like in hollywood we were both doing two different things that like within probably a four minute drive of each other and i was like I'm shaking thinking about it. I was like, Brittany, this is a now or never thing. Like I was wrapping up my shoot. I was like, let's go. I'll kick myself if I don't. And so I drive over there and they're wrapping up a photo shoot. And that's what those videos are. I just was like, hey, I walk in. Sammy's right there. Cracking open a tall boy claw. Grecking about a, a tall boy fucking gripping that white claw. Gr Ruby grapefruit white claw. Offers me one. I was like, love you so much, but hey, drove here. And I do not feel like leaving my car in Koreatown. And so he was like, so nice to meet you. Why don't we start talking? And it's so natural. Like, I do not have like nicer words to say about all of them, which is th what you want, right? That's what you want when it's your favorite band. You know, like I wouldn't love them as much as I do if they were divas, you know, and is Josh a diva? I mean, arguably, <laughs> I mean, look at him, right? Arguably. But I, I met them and I was like, they're exactly how I wanted them to be, how I imagined them and how, you know, there was nothing fake, which is thank Christ. And so I'm talking with Sammy back and forth. And it's so natural. They're so personable. So just normal. And the Jake walks up and I was like, kind of, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, do you guys have like a bathroom I could go to? I need to go like have a freak out panic attack maybe in the bathroom. I'm gonna be like, yeah, there's sweat dripping down my back. Oh, and I peed myself. Oh, okay, I peed myself. Yeah, yeah, okay. He walked up and I was like, oh my fucking God. And I hugged him and I, and I, in his ear, I was like, you're my favorite. And he was like, that means a lot. You got good taste. I was like, oh my God. And then we're talking all in a circle and, I, and then um, Redacted comes up, the lead singer. And uh, it was just magical. I mean, they have, Josh has such a presence, which is like, why I love him. He has such a presence and it's immediately like, do you know what it felt like? And I'll say this on my dying bed. If y'all are theater kids, that's what it is. It's theater kid energy. And I was a weird theater kid. And it literally, like, I, it just felt like we were in the wings on the stage during a show or, like, during a dress rehearsal, whatever. And, like, everyone knows their parts and their whatever. At this point, it's just run, going through the motions. And you're dicking around in the wings, like, backstage. <laughs> That's how it felt. We were doing characters. We were talking back and forth. We were talking, like, inside jokes immediately. That's, like, I don't, I couldn't tell you where they came from. But I was there for an hour and a half. And I, there's inside jokes. And that's fucking what the hell. And I didn't tell them about the tattoo. And I don't think I will. But I'll show you. I, it's funny to me that I'm like talking to y'all like we're on FaceTime. They're probably going to see this clip. Guess what? I'm humiliated. Love you guys. I love Greta Van Fleet. I have a tattoo for when the curtain falls. I'll put a picture up on the screen. It's my little pinup girl who um, the line, you're in and out of fashion in the Hollywood of hell. Love that line. I love the whole song. Duh. And... Uh, I just love the idea of like a little like devil pinup girl who's sitting on a star also because I moved to LA and I just like LA is such a big part of who I am now and what I do even though I'm you know it's like a how Harry Styles has the LAX tattoo like he fucking gets it you get it you doubt and so I'm not going to show them that tattoo okay <laughs> I love Grand Man Fleet and so this day Danny wasn't there Danny had to go like uh, I think he was sick or something. And so it was just the three of them. And I was like, oh my God, this, it was a 
dream scenario. We stood in a circle and did characters and did bits. And then they were like, got to go. And I was like, me too. Bye bye. Anyway, love Greta Van Fleet. And that was not a real day. I drove home and I immediately called Taylor and I cried. And she was like, how did you hold it? I was like, I don't know. Something happens when I talk to celebrities where it's like, I just, it's auto, auto drive. Like it's autopilot. And then afterward I'm like, Hey, so Hey, okay. Yeah. Hey, Hey, what? I think the first ever instance of that literally, obviously, which is like, you can't top it was Harry where it was like, I talked to him and then it was like, okay, nice to meet. And then I collapsed to the ground. Cause it's like, I don't, I wasn't there. If you know what I mean. Anyway, that's why I met Greta Van Fleet. And I can't wait to like, I'm sure I'm going to see them again or cross paths with them somewhere, somehow. And it's going to be like literally talking to an old friend. Like it was just so much fun. It was fun. This episode of the Broski Report is sponsored by my friends over at Tinder. Tinder is the world's most popular dating app. That means the most opportunity to find whatever it is you're looking for. Success on Tinder can mean whatever you want it to. In fact, 1.5 million Tinder users go on an in-real-life date every week. Brother, other apps are hard, okay? Tinder is easy and fun. Tinder also has more safety features than any other dating app. They also just released Relationship Goals, which is a new status for your profile that shows others what type of connection you're looking for. There are so many possibilities just a match away, and on Tinder, it starts with a swipe. Download Tinder today and explore all the possibilities for yourself. Moving on. I just hosted, and this is crazy. This is like, I posted a TikTok about this on my spam, like kind of um, debriefing the situation. I had the incredible and unreal opportunity to host the pink carpet for the Barbie movie world premiere in LA. How did that happen? I don't know. Okay. You guys got the wrong person. You got the wrong girl. All right. I'd probably like Emma Chamberlain or Liza Koshy was supposed to do it. Hey, they could only get me. They booked me. And I just like Warner brothers. First of all, if anyone from Warner brothers is listening, Hey, thank you. (laughs) Thank you. It is such an, like, this is a very candid thing from creator to, you know, audience and studio. And this is kind of like back channel stuff, but like to be trusted with that as an individual and as a, a professional and a creative, as cool as it is aside, like it's almost cooler to me that that y'all trusted me that much to do that, you know, to, it's brand representation on both Warner Brothers side and and my side, you know, of like, they believed in me that I could do that and that I wouldn't fuck up or crumble under pressure or whatever. And, and it really means so much that they believed in me and my team believed in me. And it was, you know, it takes a very certain skill set to be able to bullshit and banter back and forth with people you've never met and who are also S tier talent. And I was, honestly, right before it, like very doubtful of my own abilities. I was like, this is not, I cannot do this. And then I got there and I, I honestly kind of shocked myself at how natural it came. And I think that, I mean, I, I'll talk about this till I'm blue in the face where this is, I think what I was put on this planet to do is not, not only to entertain and, you know, to t- make people laugh and, and spread joy and whatever, but I just love bantering back and forth with people. It is my favorite thing to do on this planet is to have a witty conversation with someone. I, there's nothing better. And when you get to do that with people that you know so much about them, but they don't know that much about you, you know, and like, and your hope is that they walk away being like, that was an easy, comfortable conversation. Like they don't feel put out. They don't feel like, what was your favorite part of, you know, like I wanted it to be very, conversational and I wanted it to be comfortable and it just means so much that Warner Brothers trust me with that. Anyway, I'm going to like life lives were changed. My life has changed forever after this premiere. And it's just like, I could not do that 
without y'all who tune into this. So thank you, number one. Number two, holy fuck, guys. Broski Nation on the pink carpet of the Barbie movie premiere. We did it. W Broski Nation. Number three, I did not record that for um, my channels. So that will be coming out on the Warner Brothers and TikTok, TikTok accounts. So look out for that. Um, and stop hounding me for it because I don't have the footage. Fourth of all, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And I felt so beautiful. And it was such a, like, what a what a surreal thing. I just had a Zoom call with all my, my best friends from college tonight. And we make little PowerPoints and we present them to each other of, like, life updates and what we're stressing about and our latest obsessions and what we maybe need advice about and all that. And sitting down to do my little PowerPoint and being like, okay, what'd I do? Host the Barbie premiere. Um, I was like, what? how is this something that's like, I don't know. I don't have words. I'm just so grateful. Like I could honestly, I could start, I've cried about it every single day since it happened and I could start crying right now, but that's an insane thing to report, you know, to my friends. And, and I'm so thankful that I have friends like that, that are still like, I've, they've known me since I was 19. So it's just, I love it. I love it, y'all. I really do. Oh, y'all, I love it so much. I really, really do. <laughs> I had a few Nicki Minaj. I interviewed Nicki Minaj. <laughs> I interviewed Nicki Minaj and Billie Eilish and Carol G and Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling and Kate McKinnon and Dua Lipa and Issa Rae. And I just like, anyway, I just love you guys. Thank you for letting me do that. This episode of the Broski Report is sponsored by Rocket Money. Listen, I love a good mobile game. Okay, when I find one I love, I get addicted to it for a few days or weeks and I spend money on it because I have to, dude. And then I forget about it. I forget it ever existed. And guess what? I'm still paying for it because I'm just crazy like that. I am crazy. Rocket Money helps me identify those forgotten charges and cancels them for good. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about, and chances are you're probably one of them. Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you, and for any you don't want to pay for anymore, just hit cancel, and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. It's that easy. Stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash broski report. That's rocketmoney.com slash broski report. Rocketmoney.com slash broski report. Moving on. It's now time for book talk. We're moving. I, I, we got to blow through these bullet points. It's been a while. I have so much to update y'all on. Book talk, um, girlies. I think two episodes ago, I think it was episode seven um, or eight, I did Enemies to Lovers, the book trope. And I talked about Throne of Glass, how I had just started it. I was probably like not even a third of the way into um the first throne of glass, or I guess the second, because the first is Assassin's Blade. <laughs> I just finished the sixth book and I'm about to start the seventh, which is Tower of Dawn. And if you're not interested, like skip forward 30 seconds. But if you are, let me tell you something. Don't make the mistake I made. If you're going to read Throne of Glass, the series all the way through, I didn't know there was a thing called tandem reading. The way that Sarah J. Mass wrote the sixth and seventh books it's like, they're both 700 page books, dude. I wish someone had told me that you need to like read back and forth. Like, okay, you're going to read three chapters of Empire of Storms and then you're going to read one chapter of Tower of Dawn and then you're going to go back and forth because they're happening at the same time. It's just like different characters. So all of uh, Empire of Storms is about Rowan and Aelin, obviously, and Manon. And then Tower of Dawn is all about Kale. I don't give a fuck about Kale, dude. I don't give a fuck. He's a rat bastard. I don't care. You suck. I don't care about you. I hate you. I don't care. I want to, I want to, mm, 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 I want to hear them fuck. <laughs> I want to read about Rowan and Aelin. And it's devastating how the sixth book 
ends. And so I was on Reddit like a couple nights ago, like, can I skip Tower of Dawn? I don't give a fuck about Tower of Dawn. Do I have to read it? Can someone write me a summary? Is there like a spark notes? I don't care. I don't want to read it. And then all the true fans are like, read it. It ended up being my favorite book. Like, just give it a chance. I don't want to give it a chance. Fuck you, girl. I'm looking for someone to be like, you don't need to read it. Here's what happens. Move on to Kingdom of Ash. That's what I want. No one's telling me that. 700 pages of Kale and some new character. I don't give a fuck. But I'll read it. But I wish someone had told me to tandem read. I didn't know that was a thing. And now I'm half tempted to go back and like do the tandem read. But I just finished Empire of Storms and it's traumatizing. I don't know if I can reread it this early. Like, girl, fuck Kale. I don't care. Boring. Boring. But I'm going to start it. Also, it's hard to tandem read on my Kindle because I bought the books on my Kindle. So I'm going to have to go like, and it's an old Kindle from 2011, bro. It's like using a fucking rock from caveman times. (laughs) Anyway, so I'm really enjoying that right now. And Rowan, in my mind, I have... Okay, so I have updates on the casting. Okay, because the last time I talked about how (laughs) the Disneyland cast member who plays Anakin Skywalker is Kale Westfall to me. And uh, Ben Barnes is Dorian. I still think Ben Barnes is Dorian. But my casting... I'm going to throw up on the screen um, who I think Aelin is. This is what I think Aelin looks like. And Rowan is played by... I don't care. I don't, this is my podcast and you guys can suck my left nut if you disagree. Rowan Whitethorn is played by Ewan Mitchell, who plays Aemon Targaryen. Ewan Mitchell as Aemon Targaryen. That's what I think. Where are my fantasy girls at? I know I just lost a bunch of y'all because you don't read fantasy novels, but where are my fantasy girls at? I'm looking for y'all. Y'all get it or you don't. I love Throne of Glass. I don't know if I love it more than Akatar though. I don't know. I think I love them equally. Akatar is definitely spicier if, you, if you're looking for like sucking, licking, gagging, fucking. That's definitely Akatar. Throne of Glass is more. The plot is so good. Like it's an incredible plot. And it's she'll tie stuff in and I'm just like, oh my God, that was the thing when they did in book two. And now it's mega. It's literally, it's so good. And I'm, I'm like honestly kind of putting off reading the eighth book as long as I can because I don't want it to be over um anyway speaking of books that's like the fantasy sort of I love all that I love like a Game of Thrones universe I'm also going to read Crescent City after I finish uh finish Throne of Glass but before that I'm going to read Fourth Wing I have so many books I need to read Fourth Wing is like y'all won't shut the fuck up about it on TikTok you will not shut up about it and so guess what I have to read next Fourth Wing Fourth Wing it's about dragons. It's about dragons. I love dragons. <laughs> also on my list when I get through Crescent City and then Fourth Wing and then whatever is this book called Chestnut Springs by Elsie Elsie Silver. Have y'all read this book? It's like a cowboy's cowboy enemies to lovers. I'm pretty sure that's how it's been described to me. <laughs> I am so. I don't know how to describe this without being demonetized, but it is <laughs> my guttural and visceral fantasy to find my bisexual, tall, spindly cowboy, but not too spindly because I like a little bit of little bit of meat on him bones, who speaks Spanish and who has a mustache. I'm not asking for much. Or maybe I am. A bisexual cowboy with a mustache. Liberal. Okay? I I see that in my future. I deserve that. I deserve I feel like HRH collection. I deserve that. Duh. Duh. <laughs> okay? Duh. You stupid fuck. That's literally how I feel. Duh. I just need it so bad. I hope that book is good because I'm going to get my judge from that book if it's really, really good. Like, I cannot wait to read it. It's a series. Stop it right now. Oh, my God. They sell merch. Oh, my God. 
oh my god her like thighs all up on him oh my god oh my god five bucks oh this is oh let's get into it dude the rules were simple keep my hands off his daughter and stay out of trouble but now i'm stuck with her there's only one bed. And well, rules are made to be bro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 play the national anthem over that oh my god it's me riding a horse it's the me when the cowboy and the girl have to sleep in the same bed because there's only one bed <laughs> the national, oh say <laughs> and i'm proud to be an american good at least <laughs> stupid <laughs> Oh my god. Okay. Drool a little bit. When I make myself drool, it's like I don't know how we got there. Why am I drooling into the mic? You know? It's like something, it's like the orb of confusion from SpongeBob. We flip it on and they just start drooling. I need that book so bad. I might just start that, honestly, because Tower of Dawn is about to piss me the fuck off. I don't give a shit about Kale. Dumbass name. I don't care. I need a cowboy. To That's what I'm talking about. We are Christian women. We are God-fearing Southern Christian women. And I know that to be true. This episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. Make your home the hangout place this summer with crowd-pleasing eats. From a backyard bratwurst bar to tangy key lime pie, HelloFresh Market makes summer entertaining a cinch. It's also peak time for summer produce, and HelloFresh makes sure you get all the best picks all season long. Their ingredients travel from the farm to your door in less than seven days for quality you can taste. When you need dinner fast, don't call for delivery. Think HelloFresh. Their fast and fresh recipes are ready in just 15 minutes or less. Plus, HelloFresh is 25% cheaper than takeout. I personally have the too much gene, so I always end up messing up recipes because, you guessed it, I add too much of the ingredients. But with HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients, it makes cooking for myself simple and easy. So go to HelloFresh.com slash broski50 and use my code broski50 for 50% off plus free shipping. That's 50% off plus free shipping by going to HelloFresh.com slash broski50 and use code broski50. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Okay, I want to talk about this deep-rooted fear to completely shift gears. <laughs> I want to talk about this deep-rooted fear I have of Gen Z. It's already happening. Gen Z becoming cringe like millennials are cringe. But I think what's cringe about millennials is the inability to adapt and to you know, like you reach a certain age where it's like, what are the kids doing? I'm old. And it's like, you're actively making that choice to not stay engaged and like, you know, current on whatever. And I know that a lot of millennials have to do that because they work in social media. And that's how the whole BuzzFeed sort of parody came to be of like, okay, these pictures of Zendaya and Tom Holland holding hands are totally Monday mood. You know, like that shit is not that's staying engaged with what's happening, but it's in a very millennial way. And so I think the the task at hand is really avoiding the trap of generational language. And let me explain what I mean by that. There are already generational terms that separate you know, millennials from Gen Z and uh, there's going to be more that separate Gen Z from Gen Alpha uh, or iPad babies, if you will. And I think that language is such a living and breathing thing and it has everything to do with, with, you know, those sort of divides. 
And I think that it's going to be very interesting to watch it play out. I'm already seeing it on threads and on whatever of, you know, okay, any, is this thing on anybody out there? And it's Gen Z. And it's like, ah, no, 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 no. Every time I do that, I think of the um, Nicolas Cage bit. Not the beast. No. Oh. oh, my God. This video made me fucking cry. This is one of my favorite Cody videos ever. The horny chefs of TikTok. I was crying laughing. It's so good. Okay, anyway. The fuck was I talking about? Oh, uh, Gen Z on threads. Yeah, dude. It's already happening. It's already starting. And so my hope is that we'll at least be better about trying to stay with <laughs> the times and not be so resistant to change because that's what's cringe. That's what cringes people out is, is the resistance to like, you know, like you're so comfortable in your, I don't know. It's a whole thing. I'm, I'm excited to see how it develops. Also cringing at your former self is a form of growth, right? If you're not cringing at who you were a year ago, you're not growing. If you're comfortable with who you were a year ago, that's great. But I think that embarrassment and shame goes a long way. Bring back shame. Whatever happened to shame? All right. I will die on that hill. We shame people on the internet all the time. And I think that sometimes it works and sometimes people need to be shamed more. <laughs> shame is such a great uh, motivator and deterrent from certain behavioral patterns. And I think that, uh, yeah, cringe at your former self may be a form of shame, but it also is just like, who did I think I was trying to be? And who was I being that for? All right, don't quote me on that, but you can. Because it's true. I look back, I think that's what's cringy to me is when I look back at videos, even of myself during the pandemic or pre pandemic, like 2019, since I've been doing this as a job, dude, I look back on myself and I think, you know, well, I was 22. I'm 26 now. So much maturing and growing up has happened since then that I look back on, it was barely four years ago, and I'm like, oh, because oh, I just wanted to fit in so bad. But then I was also resisting fitting in, right? I was Because American hyper-individualism, I was like, I'm an individual. I don't want to fit in. But at the core of the human experience, we all just want to fit in. We want to be a part of a community, okay? And we will sacrifice parts of ourselves. We will do cringy bullshit to feel accepted in a community. And I think that is, on, on the internet, it, a very dangerous mental space to be in seeking acceptance and seeking approval from the abyss honestly from the nether it's a, a bottomless pit and uh you have to get that fulfillment in your real life because on the internet it will never be as fulfilling as you think it is and it will also not be as rewarding as you think it is and that's just how it is so your homework is to call an old friend and connect and reminisce and maybe go to dinner with a group of friends that you don't normally see. You never know. Rekindling old friendships is such a fun thing to do if you guys haven't. Because it's so fun too. Like college friends, high school friends, everyone has changed so much. If I, if you put me in a room with high school Brittany, I would probably, right? Only one of us is walking out of that room and it's not her. Decked, tanked, on the floor, KO. I was so annoying in high school, dude, but I was skinnier. I was skinny. I was 170. Okay. I was 170. I was a size 12. Now I'm a size 18, sometimes 20. Okay. I think also part of, I mean, and not to get too serious, whatever, but part of the cycle and experience of being in your mid twenties and figuring out who you are and what you are on your own and, you know, alone and with others and what you want to be and how far you are from being who you want to be, what's standing in your way, all that sort of thing. I have this obsession with the concept of home and the older I get and the farther I feel 
from my home, whatever that means, um, I spiral and spiral more out of control. So what I mean by that is I grew up in a certain environment. You know what I mean? Like a certain way that my family is um, on both sides. And by that, I do mean Republican. I grew up in a very red environment. And I always knew that we always argued, you know, like me as a child with every member of my family, I always was the one that kind of disagreed or questioned, or, you know, I never really was like really deep into Christianity. I wanted to be so bad because that's what you have to do to be accepted. You know, you have to be faithful and you have to be a good Christian. And and that's how you earn approval from your peers and your elders and whatever. And I wanted to be that so bad. And I just never really was. I remember being in vacation Bible school with my cousins at like age seven or eight or nine. And I asked one of the teachers, I was like, how do we know that people who wrote the Bible weren't lying when they wrote it down, <clears throat> that they didn't just fill in what they wanted and said, this is the word of Jesus. And the teacher literally looked at me and said, well, it's written in red. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. And then I remember asking another teacher, how do we know that they're not lying? And she said, well, God wouldn't let that happen. And as a nine-year-old, I was like, okay. And then it's just kind of this like slapping all, slap on the wrist of like, don't question, okay? And you know why? Because they didn't have the answers because those are really good questions. And that 45-year-old vacation Bible school teacher did not know the answer to it. <clears throat> So I've always, that's kind of been the foundation of who I am as a person that combined with the feeling and familiarity of a home in the South, in the Bible belt is something that is incredibly difficult for me to grapple with today. I have such intense cognitive dissonance of where physically and geographically I came from, where my family is, and then where I am mentally and physically, because I crave the familiarity and the comfort of going back to Texas, knowing the roads, knowing the restaurants, knowing my Mimi and Papa's house, my mom's house, things like that. I crave that feeling of comfort. But when I go back to Texas, it's almost anything but comfort. It is, as a woman, you know, it's like, I don't have, I'm not seen as a whole person human being with rights here, apparently, which is so awesome and cool. I don't feel safe per se. And it makes me think younger me, college me, high school me in Texas, was I just too naive and innocent and stupid to not recognize those threats against me? Was I taught to be okay with them? Was I taught to not think too critically about them? And it's just this thing of, you know, um, what do philosophers always say? What's that famous quote? They envy the stupid, they envy the ignorant, or something like that. Where it's like this burden of knowing, this burden of being informed, and this burden of not being paranoid, but of being all too aware of the threats and of, of violence that you face just being a woman. To be a woman is to perform, is to suffer, is to be punished, all of that, whatever. And so I, that all of that swirling in my head, along with all the political stuff of like, I am so left and I am so immersed in the just political atmosphere of LA. That's my norm. And so I go back home and I'm just like, this isn't home, but it is my home. And so I really struggle with this idea of home. What the fuck is it? And I was just talking with my friend Alyssa and, and Alyssa had this great point of home is not a place. Home is a feeling of who you're with. And while I do agree, I think a physical place to associate with those feelings is a normal and healthy thing to want. And when I have my own house, which I'm probably moving soon, I, I want to fill my space with those sort of things, you know, like the things that, that that remind me of the good parts of Texas and the great time I had in college. And, and I want to mix all that, you know, the rustic Texan exterior with the interior of who I am now. And 
I want to fill the space with all the things I love and memories of things I've done and my successes and my friends and my family. And I want to make my own home. And that is such a difficult thing to do as a 20 something year old, because you're in this liminal space of, you know, my parents have turned my bedroom into a guest room or a storage room or a whatever. And then I don't necessarily have a home of my own. You know, a lot of us live in apartments or with roommates. I don't really have a home that belongs to me. Also, if you're single, you know, it, it gets lonely of you only have this single dwelling to yourself. And so I just, I really am, I've been so fucking homesick lately. And then I just death spiral into, you know, what does homesick mean? And so I flew home to go see my mom um, in Houston and my whole family because I just was so homesick for the South. And I could honestly cry about it right now, but I won't because I wanted it to fix the problem and it didn't. And I just feel a little lost and I think that's okay. And I'm going to cry and that's okay because emotions are normal. I just feel a little lost even through the sea of highs and lows and successes and failures that I experience and how fortunate I am to be able to live in Los Angeles and even like have that be something that I'm, you know, potentially complaining about that I don't feel like I have a home in Los Angeles. I think this is a city full of transplants and that's a beautiful thing. You know, very few people are from Hollywood and live in Hollywood, but God, I just, I, I haven't talked about it honestly with a lot of my friends who live out here because this is a recent feeling for me. It's been such an exciting thing for the past few months, years, and we're all, all of us, I think are struggling with, how quickly life resumed after the pandemic. And I did not give my time, give myself time to adjust to this being the new normal. And how the fuck could this be normal? Because it's not. This job and this life is not fucking normal. And it's not what I was raised to expect in my adult life. And it's not anything I ever foresaw for myself. And I think the older I get, the more I realize that of like, this is so exciting and so fun. And I do think that I have the tools to succeed in this environment, but I never was prepared for this. And who is, you know, unless you set out and you're like, I want to be famous. What next? What after that? Okay. You're famous. Now what? Are you struggling with your identity and your sense of home? (laughs) Your sense of who the fuck am I? Uh, Not based on geographical and physical location. I just like, I'm really having a strange time. Being in your mid twenties is so, 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 so weird. And I think more than ever having friends that are sentient and, and aware enough to, you know, be able to talk about these things is really important. So I feel very lucky that I do have friends that relate. I'm going to cry again because I love my friends. (laughs) All my friends, you know, we're all spread out. We we graduated college and we spread out across the entire U.S. I have a friend in law school in D.C. And I have a friend who lives in North Carolina and a friend who's in Colorado. And I'm here and in Texas. And it's like we're all so spread out from coast to coast. And we make time to come together and to just celebrate what it is to be a woman in your mid-20s. <laughs> And that's so important to me. That sense of community is so important because, oh my God, I feel so lost sometimes. And I know you guys agree, maybe. It's just a crazy time to be alive and a crazy time to be a woman. And I also, yes, I'm talking about being a woman because I can only speak from being a woman. I know that almost everyone in their mid-20s, like no one has it figured out, but like I'm speaking from the perspective of a woman from the South who lives a very fortunate and privileged life. And, um, you know, it's not all about me all the time. Anyway, sorry, I got emotional. That's embarrassing. Actually, it's not, it's not embarrassing because I'm a human and to be human is to feel 
Oh my God. I was talking with Drew the other day. We were at Disneyland. I was talking with Drew about the movie Soul. The Disney movie Soul, dude. Oh my God. Like, like violently hysterical crying. I told her how she was like, same. I was like, the first time I watched Soul, my brother literally, I watched it with my family. He came over and he was like, it's just a movie. Are you okay? I was like, you don't get it. You're not like, you don't, you don't get it. Like you're not an adult who's out on their own and like trying, struggling to find their passion and purpose in life. You're like trying to get through algebra. You don't get it. Anyway, soul is such a tearjerker, dude. And I refuse to watch the good dinosaur for that reason too. The good dinosaur is like, I've heard it so sad and I just can't do it. Cause the dinosaur is so cute. He's so cute. I gotta look at him. Good dinosaur. How did I go from talking about horny? Look, he's so cute. I go from talking about horny cowboy books where they're sucking and licking on each other to good dinosaur. He's so cute. What's him name? Spot Forest. What's his name? He's so sweet. Look at him. He's got little knobby knees. Arlo. Death Arlo. He's pretty cute. Oh my god. Oh my god. I can't. I I'm, I'm like even looking at pictures of him. It's gonna make me cry. I love him. He's so cute. <sighs> okay, moving on. One more thing. I finally found a self tan that works. <laughs> To wrap on a positive note, um, beyond my struggles with identity and being homesick, I found a self-tan that works for me. It's not too orange. It's not orange at all, actually. It's a very natural tan. It stays for like eight, nine days. And it's my Bali body. I used to use Bali body in college as a tanning oil. Hey, don't use tanning oil, by the way. And now they have like a self-tan mousse that develops overnight. And it really slays. Now, does it dye my white sheets brown? Yes. And did the first time I use it, did I get up from bed and think that I had boo-booed all over the sheets? Yes. That did happen. And you just got to wash it. Okay. You just got to wash it. And that's fine. And does it smell like cat food? Yeah. Do I smell like cat food after I use it? Yeah. And that's fine. Because I look great. Okay. I look like a rich trophy wife. And you can say it. Do I still look good? I look great. Anyway, Bali Body Self Tan Mousse, uh, I do recommend. And get the mitt. And I also learned the hack that you use a little body brush on your uh, ankles and elbows and uh, neck and fingies. On your, on your little fingies. So that'll do it, I think, for this episode. We really went through the entire range of emotions. <laughs> As to be expected, horny, sad, happy, grateful. This felt like a therapy session. This was literally what I, the download I give my therapist every week. I'm like, this happened, this happened, and then this happened, and I'm feeling this way, and then what if, what if I die tomorrow? I don't want to die. That's my biggest fear. Okay, yes, I'm free next Monday. Can we do that? Yes, next Monday still works for me. Thank you. That's literally me in therapy every week. <laughs> I don't want to die. I want to die. I hosted the Barbie premiere. <laughs> Okay, talk to Nicki Minaj. Blah, blah, blah. I don't want to die. Oh my God, I'm going to die. Oh, I don't want to die. I'm going attack. Okay, yes, I'll see you next week. All right. Thanks, guys, for listening and loving you. Tune in next week. Subscribe to uh, my YouTube channel, the Broski Report channel, and Brittany Broski. And uh, follow me on Instagram if you don't follow me on Instagram. I am always active on Instagram. It is debilitating at this point. I am so addicted to my phone and I cannot stop because it's my job. It's really fun. Okay. Love you guys. Bye-bye.